Hello and welcome to this first episode of the Dark Matter podcast. My name is Ryan and I'm delighted to kickstart this new program as part of Friends of Europe new initiative, Making Space Matter. We have prepared for you a series of episodes with each time a different guest coming from a different background, a different expertise to tell you about their work and about why space matters to them. From astronomy to entrepreneurship, from climate science to diplomacy, from security issues to scientific research, we'll try to cover the different perspectives and angles that make space such a multifaceted, important and topical subject. But let me welcome our guest of today, Stephanie Tumampos. Hi, Stephanie, how are you? Hi, Ryan, I'm all good. Um, it's pretty uh, good here, the weather's yeah. so far good. So you're joining us from Munich, right? Yes. So you're, you're a doctoral researcher at the Technical University of Munich. You specialize in geodata science and its applications to the environment and to people, communities, focusing specifically on urban air pollution and climate in general, is that right? So basically I focused before on urban air pollution and now it's more of the earth system. So we're looking at a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, phenomena around the earth, like for example, the temperature uh, difference over time. And for example, the changes of land or say deforestation and then um, on uh, on say water, we, we will look at many uh, 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 factors that 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 affect the systems here on our planet. So we use remote sensing and space data for that. I see. Okay. Well, before I go more into detail into your work, I want to actually ask you about the importance that you see in science communication, because I read online that you've even taught pupils, really young kids, preschoolers about space science and science in general. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So um, first, I'd, I'd like to answer your first question about why is it important to have mm. science communication. I think it's um, in today's age, we want people to understand what we're doing as scientists, because they're, they're actually our stakeholders, our main stakeholders is the public. And we want them to utilize our science as much as how we we perceive or we want it to be used, you know, for the good of everyone. And if not, and if they don't understand what they're what we're doing, I don't think they would also be able to use it, our science properly. So science communication is very important. And also I, I teach uh, kids before, and I believe that teaching kids as young as two to three about science, um, they it gives them the power to analyze to have this good logical thinking this whole scientific method if they uh practice it every day it makes them better decision makers and when they when they practice it every day until they grow older i believe that they will be better people with good decisions and even in everyday life like you know choosing the good leaders for their country or say um choose what is good and what is uh, what are good outcomes to certain decisions that they make, right? That so, might be particularly true for climate science and in and, and your field, getting a better understanding of the, the Earth as a system and what it takes to protect it, right? Yeah, it's it's very important because if we don't um, we don't transcend our science that is understandable by everyone, especially for our Earth, I don't think we can um, solve climate crisis as um as soon as what um our target years like 2030 you know mm -hmm. these target years i don't think we can solve them as fast as we can if we don't involve the public as well mm -hmm. you know and you see this as part of your role as a scientist to to give back to people you said that there were your stakeholders i think that that's that's really that's really key giving back to the public and sh sharing that knowledge but let's jump a little bit more into your own research so you mentioned in your introduction, you're a geodata scientist, you work with remote sensing. Perhaps can you tell us a little bit what is remote sensing? What are examples of remote sensing techniques? So basically remote sensing, if if, if um, you're looking at everyday life, you have a remote control in your TV and you're not touching the TV at all. Mm. So that's 
basically the word remote, not touching. And mm -hmm. sensing is something that you're trying to get, um, you're trying to sense, you're trying to touch. So remote sensing means um, getting data without touching. So other uh, one of the techniques is, of course, our satellites, which uh, they gather data by just um, getting images or data through the sensors. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot, a variety of data that we collect, like for example, optical images, hyperspectral images, and these are, or for example, um, synthetic aperture radar images. And these are so important in our field because this is how we understand um, the earth through some techniques as well. We add more techniques to understand the processes that happens in our planet. I see that, that's so interesting because starting this podcast and thinking about space and who should I get involved in, in this conversation, I really looked at it as from the earth looking outwards, but what you're doing is actually being in space, looking back to the earth and looking at ways to better take care of the earth from space, which I think is really, really interesting. And if we go back, so you mentioned satellite imagery and different sensors. Uh, what would be some applications of these sensors? What kind of predictions can you make? What, what could you be looking at with the, those satellite information? So first, um, Earth is within space, so it's still space. That's true. <laughs> That's true. So That's very one, true. One thing we don't remember is that Earth is still in space, so we're still in space. Anyway, so one of the things we um, we we observe through satellite imagery is, for example, degradation of our forests or um, say forest fires. Uh, there are so many forest fires around the world, and we we have these technology that that has this emergency um, response or emergency uh, switch that we have a lot of um, things that we can observe through satellite data. So first is degradation of our forest or say ocean pollution, we can track that or even tracking of ships, you know, how how they navigate around our um, our waters. And for example, even um, the expansion of our urban cities you know it's very important to study the expansion of our urban cities because we our population is growing of course and we need to see how much um space do we need how much how much there is um population is growing in a city and then match it with the urban growth how much pollution can we get with that urban growth or for example um uh vertical land motion like we can detect if a, a certain area is uh, submerging over time or for example we can get um, we can also track the ozone layer if it's um, opening up again or is it closing is it is it healing or even for say um, uh, tracking marine uh, life as well like dolphins how they they move and we have these technologies right now that data science, the machine learning that detects um, certain objects over photos, over images, or even uh, see, uh, addressing food security. You know, we track food through satellite imagery as well. How much how much area does do we have for wheat? So those kind of things. So we wow. address a lot of um, a lot of uh, a lot of what we see or what we have on the surface of our Earth through satellite imagery, and not just satellite imagery. We have other means as well, like like drones or like small airplanes. So they also can carry sensors and they can detect um, or gather data on the surface of our Earth. And it's so interesting because um, it, it 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 spans. It it has this um, reach of. Uh, getting data around the earth in certain uh, in just a small amount of time, you know, like, like, for example, the Copernicus program, they have the Sentinel-2. Um, this is a satellite that takes images uh, every single day, every single time, and then it revisits a specific area every five days. So that's pretty, that's pretty neat. And that's the fastest that we have right now. So see wow that's really impressive but wait did you mention dolphins can you track dolphins from satellites oh i mean when they go up to the the um the the waters you know we track through their migration or how they move right. so it, it so that's so, quite high resolution data that you're getting oh yeah we can get that data too there are so many satellites that we have right now around the world and 
even not just satellites, but for example, drones, they can they can take images, you know, and these images are used to uh, to to be to uh, to certain, um, say, machine learning architecture. And then this machine learning architecture or model can detect objects like, hey, this is a dolphin. So those kind of things, it's, it's really amazing because our technology right now, aside from gathering data, we also process data, these data, and these are evolving over time so fast. So maybe to take just a, a step back from what you're saying. So there's a bit of, a, it's a two-step process, right? You're gathering a lot of data in satellites. So you, you mentioned images, but also different types of sensors. So um, all this data accumulates. And now the next challenge, once you have all this data, is to make sense of it, right? So instead of having a human manually coding, oh, this is a dolphin, or this is uh, deforestation, or this is pollution, you're trying to teach an algorithm, a computer, to recognize it by itself. Is that right? Is that, is that your PhD project? So not really, not technically. So these are more or less some of the projects I did before, especially in our classes. Right. But um, just to give a sense, it's like you have these images every single day, and these are super big images. Mm. The data itself is huge. So every single time you open a single data, it's one gigabyte, a single image, for example. And then you can't just process it by yourself. And you have this data, say, every three to five days. For example, you have a whole year of, um, of or five years. You need five years to track, say, um, D4, uh, no, urbanization. You want to track urbanization over five years. Uh, you can't just say that you want to open each file by yourself. So you need a, a machine that could help you determine, for example, which are these areas that are um, houses. So the machine learns that these square or rectangular um, um, objects seen on these um, images are all houses or buildings. So it helps you. So for example, a certain big um, data, so you have say a 10 by 10 kilometer um, uh, image, and then you have these, a lot of houses. You can't just count them one by one each over time. So you need the help of a machine. And that that's where machine learning comes in. That's where the computer science part comes in. And then what I do in my um, my my PhD is that I use this specific um, mathematical equation to make sense of say, or to use if we, it is, uh, it is a possibility to use this specific um, equation for for remote sensing data, because this specific mathematical equation that we're trying to use is not yet being used in in the field of remote sensing. So it's a probability um, equation, and we're trying to make sense. If it works, then it should work for our environment. If it doesn't, then it doesn't. So it's a 50-50% risk. <laughs> I guess that's part of research, right? That a, yeah. a result that doesn't work is also a, a result. Yes. But can I also ask you, where do you get all this data? Because you've mentioned we get all these pictures, terabytes of information daily, but is this freely accessible? Do you have partnerships? How does that work? So first and foremost, this um, our our technology and our um, uh, policies of today have evolved over time from the past, you know, from the past, we have to, I, I've, I've interviewed people before that they have to purchase these images and it's a um, hundred dollars per each image wow. now. Yeah. So they need to spend a lot of money just to have research, you know, just to have these data, but now we have, um, we have this movement called open science, open technology and open data. And we have really accessible data from a lot of sources. And for example, here in the European space, you know, um, we have the Copernicus program, which is freely accessible. And you can have seamless um, uh, stream of data if you establish as well a partnership, for example, um, in the Philippines, I come from the Philippines, and in 2020, I went home one time to have my vacation, and somehow my professor in Salzburg, when I was still doing my master's, tried to um, communicate, uh, tried to uh, sent me um, an email saying, 
hey, hey, Stephanie, I'm in the Philippines. Are you here or will you come home? And said, yeah, I'm actually here. And why so? And they said, and he said, this is Professor Peter Zile, and um, he's part of this uh, Copernicus uh, program where they establish partnerships with countries. And he said he's in the country to establish a partnership with our country to have seamless stream of data and also not just seamless stream of data to address our our problems in climate change, deforestation and other environmental problems, but also the skills and technology transfer. So this is amazing because this is a partnership where um, it just doesn't span uh, accessing data by yourself, but the whole country, the whole our government and our scientists can also benefit from. And I guess this is one of the goals of the um, makers of the Copernicus program. You know, they want people to use this data to analyze the data that the European Union, um, I, I'm not sure if it's the European Union, somehow we get really um, mixed up with the European, European the Union. ESA, surely. But in general, since Europeans are paying for it, um, I would say the Europeans are so uh, lucky to have this um, movement that you have this technology and you share it to everyone who could use it. It's amazing, really. I, I was so amazed with this partnership. It's, I think the, that partnership is the first partnership they had um, outside, in, especially in Asia. So, and right now I get, um, I get also emails that they're looking for, um, for people who want to work in this project. It's called COPFIL. It's Copernicus Philippines Partnership Program. So that we could use, my country could use the data collected by the satellites made by the uh, European uh, Union. So that's amazing. That, that's fantastic. That's absolutely, I think, the right way to go about space. Collaboration and sharing information and that's true for space and scientific research in general, but I think especially for space. So that's really great that exists. And, and I'm glad that, that you have access to this information so you can do the research you do and try to better understand what is going on. And um, maybe to put your research in a wider con context, I, I would like to bring in the concept of digital Earth that mm -hmm. I know you're also very close to. Um, you've moderated the Youth Forum during the uh, International Symposium on Digital Earth. In just a few words, how would you define digital earth? So it's basically digitizing everything on earth. All the data that we have, we put it in a simple, uh, not simple, this is kind of complicated actually, because it's like putting, if I put it in, a, in an analogy, sorry, this is not a few words. Somehow digital earth is a bit uh, tricky because you're putting, uh, you're putting all the data that is collected here on Earth into a digital like library that is can be accessible by people. But there are restrictions and there are still a lot of things that need to be investigated when you're doing this digitizing the Earth, because it's more or less there in there in there would in th this would involve a lot of ethics. So how how would you obtain data from people? right there's privacy issues also so it needs to be carefully um taken uh uh taken into consideration or we need to take a look a closer look at these aspects but and it's what, interesting what would be the goal of having a digital twin of the earth so one of the goal is that definitely having these data that could be that could be investigated or could be used as a research and then see if what we can um, get from these data have valuable information that we could apply to today in our, our real life, you know? So for example, if you have a digital earth, like um, say, uh, like data of real time um, uh, transportation, for example, then it's it's like a mirror of what you see every day. That's why you have these information of like when you Google on a map, uh, um, sorry for mentioning Google, but if you look into a map online and you say mm -hmm. you want to go from A to B, and that's already kind of a concept of digital earth because that's okay. that's like mapping yourself and going from A to B at a short amount of time. So that's already a concept of digital earth. Another concept would be like gaming. So gaming, you see a terrain, right? And then you use, for example, the 
like Pokemon Go, you know, this、right. kind of thing. See, like you use the whole、um, uh, real life map, but there's digital things going on. Like you're capturing、right. a specific object on your phone, but you're using a map. That's still gaming. That's digital Earth per se. And and if we apply that to climate science, is it、um, science fiction or is it realistic that in the future or perhaps even near future we could model the Earth to such an extent that say we we could simulate oh if we if there is one more degree or if the humidity changes in those and those ways this will be the impact on the Earth? Could we model this and have really strong predictions on what would happen and from a climate perspective? So, in a climate perspective, that's a goal. Like we have all these data over time, we collect this data, and and a super intelligent,、um, uh, I wouldn't say super intelligent, but there's an efficient model, a specific、uh, machine learning model or a deep learning model or computer science model that could automatically say、um, in the next few hours it's going to rain or like the wind's going to be strong. And although some of these technologies already exist. Um, we still need to get a bigger,、um, bigger span of our technology, of our data. So it's not just a specific country that's using it. We want it that we can have it for for other countries as well, you know. And in a climate perspective,、um, we're all connected in some way. So if we have this kind of technology and we have, we can have all the data around the world, it'd be so easy, I guess, in、um, in a, in an idealistic view. To track climate change, you know,、mm-hmm. but it's so impossible at this point right now because it's even harder to get data in some parts of the world, and it's not also our technology. Although it's、um, it's、uh, it's it's transforming over time so fast, we still we still need to keep up. You know, there's a lot of data every day. For example, in Copernicus program, we gather twenty terabytes of data every single day. day. As far as I know, it's twenty、yeah. terabytes of、wow. data per day. And can you imagine how much infrastructure you need to store those data? So that itself is also challenging. The more data we get, the more infrastructure we need, the more access we need. So that's there's a lot of struggle in in、um, in re,、uh, in in how do you call this in achieving the goal of digital earth. Wow, but that's those are some really exciting prospects、um, to look forward to. If if we manage to, as you say, not only store the information but also make sense of it through machine learning and AI, that 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 opens a lot of possibilities. Actually, with our our, our partners program, the EYL, the European Young Leaders, I know they have they'll have a dedicated session on digital Earth、uh, in September during the seminar. But we'll have time to come back to this. The idea of cons- consent in、um, digital Earth and how we collect data. Whose data we collect,、um, and in whose interest we collect it? How do we use it? I know you've you, you've spoken about、um, example of indigenous people in Arizona, in Alaska, in Kenya, and how how you manage those relationship and what does that mean to you? How do you go about this? Can you speak to to that? Sure.、Um, so in terms of、um, getting data from indigenous people, for example, it's all about data sovereignty. I want to circle back to what you said earlier about、uh, the idea of consent with data and whose data we collect, how we collect it, whose interests we serve when we collect it, how we use it. I know you've spoken about examples of indigenous people and how you relate to them and how you try to be respectful and mindful in how you use their data. Can you speak to that? Sure.、Um, so Ryan, there's this、um, movement as well. I won't say it's a movement, but. I think it's a movement to actually honor people's privacy in terms of data or governance, and、um, so this is what they call data sovereignty and data governance. Like, who gets to own the data? Who gets to use the data? So,、um, so far from whom I've、uh, interviewed, a lot of them,、uh, especially the indigenous pe- part of the indigenous people, is that there's this.、Um, At the back of their mind, science is a bit of the. They have this connotation that it's like col- colonialism. You know, like you go to a certain place, get something, and then you speak for and then them. Leave and use it, and not ever sp- speak to them again. Basically, exactly. So、right. they feel that during when people or scientists do science, at some. I mean, not 
I wouldn't say at 100% all the time, but there's some, there, it's, it's, it's an occurrence all the time. I mean, most of the time. So, for example, um, right now, what uh, the Geo Indigenous Peoples Program, uh, this uh, Geo Group on Earth Observations, they have this um, section for Indigenous people as well that they want to um, they want to promote the welfare um, of the day uh, of Indigenous peoples and using their data, especially in the applications of Earth observation. So they want to be involved in the project. So they are pushing for projects to have more um, more funding and time and effort before doing, for example, a certain um, collection of data. What I mean is that before collecting data, you have to talk to the people. You have to do your research on how to respect the these uh, the respect the people that have these data, right? And then you have to put them. For example, in your research, everything and all in paper or, or rec I mean, simply recognize them because first and foremost, they're the ones who have the data and you just simply took it from them and then also give them the result of these research because, you know, the, they're the ones who should actually benefit from this research, not not a bunch of um, researchers and journals where you report your research and you don't speak in behalf of them because you're not there to experience this kind of climate change um, effect, right? Yeah. You we're just there to visit, get data. You can't just do that right now. It's, we have to have the science of mindfulness, you know, this specific mindful science or kinder science. We need to be kind and also empathetic we need to incorporate these throughout time through the longest time in science um hundreds of years before it has always been there's this um uh there's this look that science is for the elite right so those who could afford to go to school right and before it was only for men right and it should change it changed over time where women were involved already in the scientific field but Right now, we need to involve the whole of community, whole of humanity. Mm -hmm. So I could relate to that because in my country, we have a lot of indigenous tribes as well and indigenous people. And um, in certain islands that um, we, I think, unconsciously, I guess, because we, if you're not mindful enough, you think it's okay, right? Mm -hmm. So it, because it has been done for hundreds of years. and. Um, there are a lot of indigenous people in the Philippines and we just take their data, you know, we in general as scientists or even for for people who just get their resources and it's not right to abuse this because for them, this is not just um, owning a land or owning the area, but it, it was passed on by their um, ancestors as ancestral lands, for example, um, and these are precious to them, you know. Mm -hmm. And you can't just say, I I want to uh, check if we can um, build a dam here and we can just pay you money. It's not all about money for them too, you know? I think this is a beautiful way to wrap things up. And it, it really circles back to what you said at the beginning about science as collaboration and as giving back to the people that actually are the one, other stakeholders, other people that, that should benefit from the science you do from the people you collect data with to the to sharing the knowledge you get from that data. Those are the important steps to take. And that's especially true, I think, in the case of space and climate, because at the end of the day, we are all facing the same catastrophe ahead of us. And it is together that we need to make sense of what is going on. It is together we need to collect data and make sense of that data, model the earth and try to find solutions to the um, to the changes that are, are coming. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, we learned so much today. I think if I should wrap this up, my one thing you said is that to remember that Earth is part of space as well, and that okay. we are all part of this ecosystem and we should work together to sustain it and protect it. Um, we'll speak next week a little bit more about uh, the overview effect as well and what it means to realize to have this realization that we are all on this little rock flying in space and how that should make us conscious of certain questions. 
Uh, but for now, I'd like to thank you once again, Stephanie. I would like to thank Andy Peppa and Sean Flynn as well for helping me putting all of this together. And I look forward to seeing you next week for the next episode of the Dark Matter podcast. Thank you so much. <laughs>